Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's lecture. For those uh, with us in room 315, uh, it's great to have you here in the flesh. Uh, and for those online, uh, I hope that these events really open up other opportunities for continued dialogue across time zones and geographies. I'm personally very happy to be back in person, but more than anything, after a year of being masked up mostly alone, now that I am in public again, I feel like I'm wearing a veil, a, a chador as it were, and can only underscore my empathy for those whose expressions are concealed a lifetime. I can't imagine living like this anymore. And yet it's just the beginning. Tonight, uh, we're fortunate to have Gary Bates as our guest, the first of our three visiting professors in the option level studios. Working in collaboration with Gro Bonesmo, I hope I haven't uh, mispronounced that, Gary had Space Group, which was founded in 1999, right after he stepped down from OMA with several years of leadership behind him. The pedigree shows, uh, as with many other alumni, and it results in a blend of kinship and Oedipal reckoning. His own retroactive epilogue to Cool House's Biennale is emblematic of this push and pull in both reverence and rejection. If Cool House's elements predictably dealt with the objects of architecture, whether windows or stairs, fireplaces or elevators, he ultimately demonstrated a fidelity to the artifact itself. Instead, Gary identifies the critical, if missing, element, people, the very inhabitants of those artifacts, their agency, their cultural differences, their genders, colors, and what makes them make a difference. How is it that these people impact spatiality and how might they give form themselves? Gary presents us with polemics as a central part of his framing of questions. That with, a, that with a characterization of the current state of the discipline that is dire, he takes no prisoners. Architecture is dead, he proclaims. Well, of course, we hear that once every 10 years, but it is Gary's command of language uh, and with a rhetoric that is as persuasive as elusive that he brings to his writing and thinking a unique skill that fills the gaps between forms and words, spaces and ideas. With very little space for the romantic image of the architect, he leaves no room for sentimentality. The architect, as we know, as a figure and architecture as a discipline are phenomena that he characterizes as out of sync with the rapid ascendance of other social phenomena, be they technologies, economic infrastructures, or building information systems. He has no empathy for rules, nor the rule breakers. A discipline that he sees as the bottom of the food chain, architecture seems to be on the brink of obsolescence. And it is only our imagined relevance that allows for ample denial to keep us moving forward. I hope I haven't mischaracterized this. However, with all that is lost in the architectural object, he finds redemption in architecture's relationship with planning, a, a political and intellectual space that is composed of layers and protocols too complex to be defined by the terms of objecthood. The work of Space Group then is as much trapped by the disparity between in architecture and urbanism as it thrives from it. Buildings and objects yearning to engage externalities and landscapes and urbanisms in search of tangible qualities that evade the prescription of policy alone. And herein lies the predicament. How do we imagine a space of relevance beyond architectural objecthood and all the while ensuring a built landscape that can embody the cultural aspirations of the very people it seeks to represent with a level of specification that only architecture can depict. So to help explain and overcome this, please help me welcome Gary Bates. 
who is already at the podium. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a bit uh, unreal, a bit surreal to be here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Nadir specifically, who I know indirectly got a tip from a good friend of mine and what places me here now. Um, but m more than that, he gave me the idea to come here. Um, Anna, she gave me the idea to leave Norway, sell everything, and the motivation to do so and the belief that it was possible. So people ask me, am I, when am I going back or if I'm going back, um, it's to be seen. But uh, right now, uh, it's really good to be in New York. Uh, I never saw it coming uh, whatsoever. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to, let's say, do something I've never done before. I'm going to do many things tonight I've never done before because as a good friend of mine over here told me that uh, the format of lecturing is uh, will change radically like everything else. Um, so I'm going to talk about some personal things, which I never do. Uh, it's totally unarchitectural to me. I even did something really um, unexpected, and that was you know, my, my mother is not well. Uh, she hasn't been well for some time, so... Um, I got a call from my brother and saying that uh, we need to clean out her house. So we did that, mostly he. I was in Europe. Um, and then, of course, I knew that hiding beneath her bed was my student work. He'd been there for 30 years, untouched, in a box, perfectly her opening it every once in a while, looking at it. Um, so I called my father and asked him to send it to New York. And, uh, and, uh, and I took pictures of that and some of that I'll show you here, not all of it, of course. Um, so that's uh, one of my uh, secrets. And the, maybe one of the reasons for doing that was for me to kind of look back and see some things uh, and how they influenced me. In addition, the lecture is quite raw. I don't have the whole uh, operation of my office behind me and uh, assistance and things. So there's uh, a lecture that's filled with iPhone pictures uh, as much as kind of professionals. There's no Elon Baum in this lecture. I'm sorry, he's a good friend of mine. Um, so this is a lecture that kind of really shows the work uh, and it's um, uh, the way I'd like it to be seen. Um, but I, so like I started, this lecture becomes uh, particularly liberating for me as I return to New York for the first time in 30 years, but that's not the real liberation. Um, the context I left in the beginning of the 90s, which despite the collective and in some ways beautiful amnesia of Americans was not dissimilar from today. I met a man in the park yesterday, uh, an old black man um, who, was, uh, who sold me a piece of poetry. Um, he sat down, we talked for some time. Um, he told me he was arrested in the 90s for a minor possession charge, uh, which changed his life forever. Uh, now he's trying to help other people change their life. Uh, while we're sitting there, the smell of reefer was filling the park. He reminded me, he said, remember when we did this? He goes, we did it with respect. We always hit it and didn't blow it in people's faces like now. I had to confess I remembered that. I referred to Rodney King and said, uh, you know, people talk about all the events that have happened recently. And I said, well, you know, those events were happening before. They just weren't as, as, as visual or as present in our life. Um, he said, yeah, that was 1992. He said it instantly. You know, many people would have taken him as a homeless guy, but I saw there was something there. I didn't get arrested. I could have. Well, actually, I did, but nothing life-threatening. I went to the university, uh, Virginia Tech. It was the first one in my family uh, that ever had been to school, uh, and I was really fortunate to do so. Um, and shortly after, I left. But the liberation I want to talk about is one that was offered to me by this lecture. Uh, is that according to the accreditation boards that are unwrapped in the United States, much like the ISO standards, the LEED standards, the BREAM standards, the well-building standards, is that I stand before you not as an architect, but only as a critic and thinker. Uh, that's something I've become increasingly appreciative of and find that incredibly liberating. Um, the last time I lectured in the U.S. was a very, very long time ago. I was with a group of Norwegian colleagues at a famous Ivy League neighbor here on the island. It was an epic failure because unbeknown to me, the audience was hungry for old Scandinavian hits. Let's call it ABBA architecture, uh, none of which I had with me. Um, I think we have, a, we have to look differently at architecture as intellects, as activists, as social anthropologists, as cultural barometers. We have to look beyond the increasingly limited framework that architecture is presenting. 
In 2007, I curated the Oslo Architectural Triennale. A year late, due to the failure of any intellectual accord between the controlling institutions. After inviting me for a critical perspective on their future, they subsequently invited me to be the first curator of their event, um, which I uh, which I took, reorganized their system, created an organization, and that first one was entitled "The Culture of Risk." And it was aimed directly at Norway. It's obtuse wealth acquired in the 70s through the extraction of natural resources, oil predominantly, and minerals, gas, and the seemingly infinite support system that it gave rise to with an ultimately paralyzing effect impacting many of the discourses that we have as architects. I come from a background of critical thinking. I studied film, philosophy, literature, uh, printmaking, and politics. The cumulative effect of the background was rather abstract, was a rather abstract understanding of architecture um, as an understanding of the world around me. I only needed to distill it into something productive, impactful, and architecture became an outlet for me to do that. Um, I want to start this evening uh, with a selection uh, first of plans that I want to show. No, first I want to show um, if I'm able to change slides. That's me. Um, I, this is uh, an all 100% honesty. This is minutes before I decided to become an architect. Uh, I was 12 years old, and if anyone doubts me, I have proof. I have a small sketchbook um, where I went and sketched every building in the university, and I uh, decided that I would become an architect. Um, so, and this is right before, maybe actually this is me celebrating. On the, on the left-hand side, that's my brother. Um, you just see his afro. On the right-hand side, those are my father's hands. Um, I'm going to show you a series of uh, plans. Um, and uh, these are not the plans. Um, this is what I stole from my mother's bed. Um, and these plans, because I understand also here in Cooper, it's not common to talk about uh, necessarily about uh, uh, urbanism and planning the way uh, that uh, Nadir introduced. I'm going to show five plans, just single plans. And you're going to have to painfully listen to me talk about these uh, plans. Um, each one innocuous and not uh, particularly understandable without the story I'm about to tell. But collectively, they show how I'm trying to use my voice and the platform of architecture, um, that the platform that architecture provides to make a more habitable, more human, more positive world. This is, sorry. This is my thesis project, sketches for my thesis. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this quote. Um, this is uh, the words which, pref which preface my film, Lessons of Darkness, are in fact by me. Pascal himself could not have said it better. Pascal was a famous mathematician, but this was not Pascal. This is uh, Werner Herzog that said it. So he created a fake quote in the beginning of his film to create credibility for an issue that he wanted to discuss which was uh, a particularly uh, political, political charged uh, film. He writes, he goes on to say, I see the quotation from, from Pascal about the collapse of the stellar universe, not as a fake, but as a means of making possible an ecstatic experience of inner, deeper truth. Just as it's not fakery when Michelangelo Pieta portrays Jesus as a 33-year-old man and his mother as a 17-year-old. So I want to come back to this, but um, the title of the lecture was Make Make. I'll tell you a little bit about Make Make because that's the, that's the future for me. And these are three of you know, the pillars that uh, define uh, Make Make. All right, so this is the first plan. Um, and they're only plans, there are no pictures. There's nothing else coming, don't wait for it. Um, this plan is a shopping, this was a shopping center, uh, which was originally the inner harbor of Oslo. Interesting about this plan, um, the CEO came to me, he said that the shopping mall is kind of in dire straits, uh, can you help us? Uh, I said, absolutely. The first thing I told him was he needed to get rid of the shopping mall. Um, 
after convincing him that getting rid of the shopping mall was a good idea, then I convinced him that he needed to invert all of the buildings. Uh, do we have a pointer by any chance? No, okay, great. Um, so convinced him that uh, he needed to, uh, needed to get rid of the shopping mall, he needed to compress all the commercial space on the one level. In that compression on the one level, he would invert all the buildings inside out. By inverting all the buildings inside out, suddenly the streets became populated. After the streets became populated, we also said that all the 16 lobbies for all of the people working there, 3,000 or 6,000 people that work there, they would all have addresses that would all go out to the side streets. By creating that opportunity, let me see if my pointer works. Huh? It works? Okay. Um, so there were five basic moves, get rid of them all, compress all the program, invert all the industrial buildings. After we inverted all the industrial buildings, create a clean cut through the buildings, which was irreverent to all the structure and everything they met. Um, and in doing so, then we also uh, redeveloped all of the cores of the building so that these cores that you can see around the periphery all organize themselves towards the side streets that 6,000 people populated. This is now the most popular neighborhood in the city. His shopping mall lost 25 to 30% of their former commercial space. Um, and they had a 35 to 40% increase in profits the first year. It was a win-win. People came back to the neighborhood. Um, even the people who lived there stayed there. That's plan number one. Um, plan number two, which these projects will come up again later, um, this is the scale that we started looking at. It's the scale that we kind of start to look at any project. This is in Tromsø in the far north of Norway in the Polar Circle, a really beautiful place. Um, we designed, it was a competition in which we were competing against uh, uh, some very interesting, famous people, who I'll tell you later. But here, an analysis of the public space. That analysis of the public space was initiated by one photograph I made. That photograph was a woman crossing the street with a baby in her arms, two people cross the street in the other direction, all four of them stop in the middle, uh, have a conversation, cars are driving by on each side, and the woman was breastfeeding. Now, the significance of that was simply that if you came back a month later, the streets were covered in snow, the sidewalks were covered in snow, the grass was covered in snow, and you only have buildings that are kind of standing in this field. So the way they territorialized space, the way they occupied space was something completely different than we were familiar with in any other urban setting. And for me, I found that incredibly uh, powerful and had to think about how to, uh, how to work with um, public space and how to work with territorialization in this specific uh, location. Um, this project I'm also going to show you, um, this is in Sunnes. It's on the west coast of Norway. Uh, the Sunnes is a small uh, town, but in fact, in the capital of where all the oil production is happening with Stavanger and Sunnes. Um, we did a, um, a plan for this uh, city, which uh, was premised on a couple of things. Number one, getting rid of all the parking from the downtown of the city, getting rid of all the parking means we had to reorganize all the infrastructure. And we reorganized all the infrastructure, which meant we also created a, a rapid transport bus system. And then, which the engineers were said were not possible. They've since built a rapid bus transport system. They have gotten rid of all their parking. Um, this is the largest, uh, say, shopping center in the area. They protested the project, offered to pay for a separate project uh, that they would finance themselves if we would keep the parking and get rid of our project. Um, they didn't succeed. Uh, our project was built. His profits have skyrocketed. And the main reason that we succeeded in this effort was because of the, the way that we engaged the public. Uh, in this case, specifically, there is a magical organization here, which is called the Ungebistera. And the Ungebistera is the shadow government by high school kids who sit and follow all the all the government meetings of the city. And those guys have a voice, and that voice uh, was initiated by us, uh, and that uh, enabled the project and enabled us to do all the things that we wanted to do here. That's the third plan. This is um, a, a project uh, which I'm not gonna show, I can just talk about briefly, um, which is a farmland not far from Sunness, um, a project together with MBRDV, um, where we're looking at a different typology for housing, which we're looking at preserving uh, the existing park, and we created this uh, and created this ring of different typologies um, that allowed us to interface 
all these interstitial and all these green spaces uh, in a in a really unique uh, in a really unique way. And the last project, which I am going to show you, is uh, the Oslo Central Station, which is uh, uh, an incredibly important project. It's been ongoing for now 13 years. Uh, it's still going on, uh, and the whole idea and this map, which is relatively invisible, shows it fairly well. Similar to the cut that you saw in Akabriga, this is a which was a public cut, a street that we cut through the first project, the first plan I showed you. In this project, we also made a similar cut. Um, it's a 300 meter long cut that goes through, cuts through a number of different buildings, creating a street and basically shifting this, you know, there's a phenomenon that's occurring now today where train stations and things are becoming essentially shopping malls and kind of a, an endless sprawl of, com uh, of commercial space. And this whole idea of this proximity to transport, originally, this is the old station, the train stood inside here. You walked in this door and the trains were here directly in front of you and you walked straight on your train and, and went away. As this thing has grown and as it's kind of spread, the doors are getting pushed further and further out and you're forced to walk through a shopping mall in order to get um, to your train. Um, we created uh, a 300 meter long uh, public uh, space, uh, non-commercialized space. We're allowing all the, all the tangential uh, commercial activities to, to kind of exist at the same time protecting both the accessibility but also accelerating a new tendency which was the north-south connection versus the predominantly west connection the wealthy side is on the west the north-south uh, the south is the water which now has the opera that you may know and the north side was a kind of uh, up and coming well in my mind up and coming neighborhood in terms of population a much bigger population Okay, so those are the moves that we did. Um, I promised my students no renderings. I'll try to keep to that. I'm gonna show seven or eight projects, um, depending on how much time we have and your stamina. Um, and each of those projects, let's say, builds further on this way of seeing, thinking of making that I'm trying to put forth. I wanna, but I'm not gonna show you the projects in there, let's say, full, like, here's the concept, here's how we started, here's how we got there, this is what we created, this is what worked or didn't work. I'm just going to use each project in a way to, and, and as I said, they're fairly rough um, and cluttered and sometimes glossy, but mostly not, um, but rather use each project as a way to talk about ideas rather than explaining all the ideas of one project. So a slightly different uh, way I want to talk about them. Um, the first project is Rutan, which you already saw. This was the. Uh, this is how Rutan looked when we first kind of arrived. It was. Uh, it's here on the left side. Is a bus terminal. Um, this is the station for the bus terminal. This is the train station above, uh, and this is a parking lot. And this is the shopping center as we described. Oh, you don't. Well, that's really too bad. Then you're going to have to imagine, like everyone on Zoom, that um, there's a shopping mall to the south, and on the left side is the bus terminal. I don't need to point. I don't need sound. I'm totally good. <laughs> um, yeah, so here we wanted to, let's say, for starters, uh, we wanted to create a discourse where everything was in play. Simultaneously, the complete, the future, the possible, questioning ownership, questioning the plasticity of the infrastructure and its absence or disappearance. <laughs> I love this. I love this. Thank you. Um, questioning ownership, back to what I said before about the family in the street, territorialization, questioning the plasticity of infrastructure, the absence or disappearance, uh, the Tehran Vog, the definitions on the D, say, densification. So here it is, uh, or here it was. In this scene, you see them when they're uh, having an event uh, called the Blink, which is a kind of race that goes through the center of the city. The bus terminal in all of its glory, kind of interesting that the city has the capacity and the density to allow uh, to store buses in the middle of the city, which we've since changed the ring, the grid of trees, the pavilions, the gradation of green, um, the bicycles, the green structure, the benches, the water, 
the lighting, the route, the skate park, the water. Those are the interventions that we kind of started with. On the, in this slide, you'll see how the situation was when we approached it. This is the infrastructure. This is what we worked on. Now, all of these things that created this beautiful project started with a dissection and deconstruction of this. Not a lot of fun, uh, I would say, but that effort that we made, that 15 years or so that we put into it, resulted in something that's pretty uh, magical. This is, let's say, before. You have to look closely for the difference. This is after. You can see the rerouting of infrastructure. We got rid of the bus terminal. The terminal is the terminal's gone. The infrastructure is rerouted around it. This space now is entirely liberated. We also are currently doing the master plan here. This building is um, this building is complete. This building is starting construction in the fall. This master plan is also car free. So with the exception of the city hall building, which is encircled by traffic, we managed to liberate this site, liberate this site, um, reorganize the high-speed bus line, and give us a stop in front of our property to make sure all these people have access. Um, so those were, let's say, the moves that we did that went beyond the scope of our work. This is for my guys, uh, showing them some other ways of presenting. This is how we kind of imagined it. The roof presents covering. The roof also helps us uh, helps us divide the site into three zones or four zones. Let's say you have the zone which is where the bus terminal was, uh, which is no longer there. You have the zone of the roof itself, which is this city it rains about two hundred eighty-five days a year. You have the zone in the middle, which creates an event space and a kind of natural, uh, natural, let's say, uh, area uh, for concerts, uh, etc. And then you have the zone, uh, then you have the zone to this side here, which is where the playground and skating park partially covered, partially outdoor, and the denser, greener part of the, of the site. Looking from the train. And now you're going to get some bad telephone pictures. This is how it looks now today. It's uh, those wooden fences will go away. The, the, now it's a very early stage, the landscape. This is, it actually just opened this spring. So this is the first kind of green that is coming up. Uh, the roof is moving in, in many ways, both across its section, uh, in its length, uh, in its width, giving different perspectives, different proximities to the ground uh, and covering. All of the tile and patterning on the ground is also parametrically modeled. Each stone was kind of given a dimension, place, and size. And we mapped out these kind of tens of thousands of stones. I'll go really quickly through it. Some of the different types of furnitures, some of which are used by skaters, some of which are normal furniture standing in the space. We couldn't escape the ubiquitous water feature but we also have a much more interesting water feature, which is that all the rainwater that's collected on the roof all moves to one place. And it's raining, as I said, 285 days a year, creating a one whole side of the ring is a rain, is a kind of continuous rain shower. It's incredibly populated, kind of constantly populated as you approach them, uh, yeah. These look like renderings, but they're not, I promise. So the pictures are beautiful. The effort to get to these pictures is enormous. This is a, like I said, a 10, 12 year project. And I apologize for the photos, but they, they do have a beauty in there. Some of their rawness, some of them are approaching professional. Now you see the shopping center on the left, the skate park, which is partly covered, which means they can skate year round, which for them, there's almost never any snow here because it's by the coast.
really simply detailed, but not as easy as it looks because the grid, if there's a grid that you saw in those early diagrams that where that grid is going continuous from the green through the structure across the entire, um, across the entire site. So that means we have a circular structure, but a rectangular, but a square grid. Um, it's all, uh, it's a uh, glue laminated um, with uh, aluminum cladding. which gives a quite nice reflection. That's a photograph by Mette Trumbull, a famous Norwegian photographer. Okay, that was the first. This is the Central Station Project. This is a competition that we won. I also have a, I also have a small lecture at the end that we make it about competitions, something that we uh, do infrequently. So this is the Central Station Project, an underground tunnel that you see coming up on the left, the train tracks coming up on the right, the historical building popping up here now. We're moving vertically up through the building. There you see the trains in the tunnel. Now we're coming up to the upper level. Our building has to navigate all of this existing structure in the basement. Everything that you saw so far is existing. Here comes our first new intervention. Here comes our second new intervention. Here comes our third new intervention. Cut number one, two, three. Uh, parametrically modeled roof by AKT. Um, basically, there are a limit to the number of points where you can land due to tunnels, due to existing foundations, due to all the truck traffic underground for deliveries. So each one of those, it's a steel, um, they're steel clad beams, which I'll, you'll see potentially in some pictures. I'm not showing um, really that, but it's actually really nice. I kind of want to see it again because I didn't see it. But, um, sorry, I'm not going to see it again. <laughs> that was a rendering, I apologize. This is the existing situation. So this cacophony of things that, uh, let's say, of elements of kind of architectural elements that, that is inevitable. I remember already in the 90s, 80s, even looking at it in terms of Utrecht, one of the big uh, train stations and the hubs, one of the big four say, cities in, in the Netherlands around the Randstad, um, was, you know, as these stations you know, became larger and larger, in particular in Europe, and I think it's not different here in the US. I mean, the train stations in Europe are a bit like the Greyhound bus stations in the United States. And as these things kind of grow and uh, filled more and more with grab and go shopping and hot dog stands and kind of completely meaningless forms of uh, consumption and let's say shit shops, that this, you know, this growth also creates such a, you know, there's such a, for me, uh, loss uh, in a way in terms of the uh, proximity of, uh, of people, the proximity of people to transport, that whole kind of joy of traveling is, uh, is gone. Um, and something that we wanted to, to do, but through a very difficult means, as I say, this is number one, we cut through all of this uh, fabric here to create a new building. Uh, secondly, we demolish this building, which is no longer in use to build a, uh, basically saying this is the building that was most retracted, most invisible, and if they needed to commercialize the space, here's where they should commercialize it. But of course, not interrupting this disruption where we have to cut through. Um, commercializing this space, which is on the axis from the, from the castle, which is essentially a kind of protected line. So meaning you'll see a cut between that two buildings to create a split tower. And then the third space was rather than this, this brown cheese cake that was here. We demolished that structure, which is a single story structure filled with shops, uh, clothing stores, Forex, the typical things, which now you enter the station. As I said previously, you enter the station here, and then you, the trees were standing here. This is the old station. Now you enter the station here, you walk through 100 meters of, uh, of shopping, or here, which is now a giant shopping mall in the middle of this one. Um, in order to arrive and this is a giant shopping mall. So this is a shopping mall. This is a shopping mall. This is a shopping mall. Uh, and those are the ways that you actually get to this street and the trains. This is the west side of the city. This is the affluent side of the city. This is a sort of the less so. 
the river comes out here and that river was in a way the division like many cities have like uh, infrastructure has defined the cities in this case the river which is covered defined that divided the city into two parts um but interestingly enough the majority of people now and the biggest growth in the city is in the north and that access then kind of uh let's say allowed us to rotate the station 90 degrees so here's a bit just the history as you can see as i was telling you this is the original track the original building the extension to the original building the building of the high rise the building of the tunnel the building of the new central hall that i called the brown cheese building this is the airport terminal which is no longer in use the shopping mall and then the hotel opera which is this horrific structure here <laughs> So this is how you originally took a train in Oslo. Um, pretty amazing. So instead of oozing out to the city, we reduced the station to a pure boulevard, connecting the adjacent streets and plazas, bringing the city back into the station. And rather than a shopping mall in disguise, we wanted to celebrate travel as a pure experience. Inspired by the simplicity of the original station typology, removing many additional uh, elements added over the years, making one single cut city to fjord. So that's the existing situation on the left, the new situation on the right. Also, by removing this building, we create a public space here, which means a public space close to the building, public street that comes through the building, direct access to the tracks, direct access to the city. So we reduced the distance between the travel, which is how it is today, from here to the tracks. We reduced it to the street there. And this is our proposal. And this number kind of allowed us to, there, there are two things that made this uh, scheme possible, that made it feasible. Number one, of all the competitors in the competition, this was the smallest scheme with the greatest yield. So for the developer, I think he never looked past the bottom line, um, not understanding the complexity of what we were proposing, but we had the smallest program, but with the, with let's say, whereas we didn't focus on the shopping mall and focused on the mix and diversity of functions there, plus the added public space, it gave him a much better um, business case. So we gave him a business case. We made an economic plan for it. We gave him a technical case together with AKT, but also this simply showing where the city is really moving. So while they're building, while they're building a station that keeps growing in this direction and growing in this direction, the city is really growing in that direction. These are the public spaces in the city. As you see, uh, ever since that's happening in Trump's, I've become obsessed with uh, understanding the proximity and types and sizes and orientations and daylight and sunlight uh, and covering or non-covering and territorialization of public spaces. This is the beautiful entrance to the Syrian station from the north today. So that's what's kind of we found so ironic. This is the situation. There's uh, the majority of people. There are 50 million passengers a day. The majority of people are coming from the north. And this is the reality. This is what they're confronted with. So obviously, our suggestion would be to bifurcate between those buildings and all the way to the south and towards the fjord. These are the, this is the, some beautiful telephone images from inside the station today. All along the cut, this is, the, this is what we're cutting, let's say. This is my cut and arriving on the south side. This is the, let's say, inspiration. This is the model, not the rendering, guys. So this is the structure that we developed together with AKT. And what we essentially create is a bridge that goes through. Uh, the argument is that the space above, which is office space, um, number one, there's a public space here, which, which navigates the different heights, navigates the service areas, navigates the tunnels, and allows the connection from the north side now, which we've reached, to actually come up and through the building. These are the towers that I told you about. And on the top, there's a 300 meter long park that's also publicly accessible um, here in this axis here towards the south. So everyone from the south and from the upper roof, when they're tired of standing on the sloped roof, they can come here and walk on that park there. Um, and that section then, each one of these points 
Um, these steel kind of this is uh, these are steel steel construction. Each one of those points is carefully defined. As you see, each stand is different because they're just very specific points where you land on. But it creates a kind of uh, uh, a beautiful condition underneath it. The tower, which looks like this. There is the access to the roof, which comes out there. And um, this is, uh, since I couldn't show any renderings, then this is the best I could do. Now we're looking uh, towards the new building and the square on the entry from the city side, going over the tunnel and back down through the existing building and out to the south side. Our back is now to the water and to the opera. The red are the two towers. You see the access going through those two towers onto the roof, sorry. Now we're looking along the roof. You see the old station to the left, the train tracks to the right. Okay, enough of that. Um, we designed a hotel, um, another one of our uh, challenging projects, which is a competition, um, which we won. Um, this is the site. Uh, you can see the hotel just made in here. I'll show you really quickly. For the hotel, I'm not going to talk about it so much urbanistically, but the interesting thing about the hotel, and a little bit inspired by, uh, let's say, the journey atrium hotels that you kind of know so well, but uh, those are all based on a kind of vertical repetition that kind of creates a beauty just in the insane repetition and scale. Here we're at a kind of completely different scale and it's based on a more centrifugal kind of horizontal slice of, of a journey like atrium, you could say. So each one of these arms of the hotel that you see here um, kind of are split apart. Uh, there, there's a mix actually originally the idea is that each one would be, um, which would be single loaded. Now, uh, some of them are in fact, it's a combination of single loaded and double loaded um, and connecting the arms, say connecting these uh, four arms, this gold uh, creature that's, uh, that's on it, um, that's collecting all the public spaces, both in the roof, uh, restaurants, uh, meeting rooms, but also covering the public spaces. The pinch that we are creating in this uh, creates, uh, so just below here, this is the 2000 seat conference facility. These are, this is the hotel. This is uh, the roof that I'm talking about from the hotel. Um, the pinch creates a public space for the conference and still out and they act in the public space for uh, the hotel guests and they meet at the, at the pinch point. And then each of those forearms are connected by a series of uh, prefabricated bridges, which I'll show you. But what I'm actually going to show you with this one is not the hotel, but some of the details from the hotel. This is a, a massive research book that we did uh, after um, the construction of the hotel, uh, which is quite normal, I think, for architects to do. Um, so showing you a few of the details that we kind of investigated. One of the windows, these are some of the studies. That's a model uh, of some of the studies that we're looking at for the windows of how we could, uh, let's say, navigate it. I just want to show one detail from the window, which there was a German woman named Gesine who worked for one year and then quit immediately uh, on the windows. Um, this was her frustration and reason for leaving, which took us that time to solve. Um, if you guys notice that to go from here to here, we have to go through a square iteration and we couldn't, uh, let's say we had to find a way that we could get our screen pattern to actually migrate without going through square, which is more difficult than it sounds. You should try it sometime um, to create the, uh, the effect that we wanted for, for the windows. So here you see the facade going up. Um, these are actually all of the rooms on one floor in the building. I cheated, it's actually two floors because some rooms are occupied by guests, but it's a rotation around the entire building uh, one time. Those are some of the obsessions that we have to understand how they were working, what views they were giving.
there were lots of rooms on one floor. That's it. But we design everything. We design all the carpets, all the patterns of the carpets, all the migrations of the carpets, the gradations of them uh, for each of the rooms. This is one of those situations where we were uh, uh, in everything. There's uh, chandeliers that we uh, designed. Um, the chandeliers look like this. This is the detail of the chandelier. This is the chandelier installed, um, looking at it from the bottom the lifting, the mounting of the chandelier. This is actually a photograph from how they look in place. That's an acoustic wall to the left, which I'll show you. This is the acoustic wall, um, doing really interesting calculations, understanding the reverberation times in the room for different speakers, different events, different types of performances they would have in the room. It then looks like this, as you can see, the underside perforated, the top side not perforated, which then looks like that when standing against the chandelier. And this is the chandelier when it's off and it loses that volume because all these elements are transparent in the chandelier itself. Something as simple as the bathroom. The sketch on the left there shows uh, a bathroom of mirrors, each one uh, slightly shifted and adjusted. So the bathroom looks like this when you walk in. Uh, if you look carefully, you can see the views outside in some of these panes of glass. The lobby and the facade and the cladding in the lobby, um, which is both windows, um, but, all, but also cladding. Here we're looking up towards the bridges during construction. Here we are now standing on one of the bridges. That's also not a collage, although it looks like it is. This is a completed construction. The gold roof, now we're standing in the lobby for the conference center, looking towards the lobby for the, uh, for the visitors for the hotel. Some of the windows that are looking from the corridors, uh, from the rooms that look back into the lobby. A, a piece that folds down into the foyer, bringing natural light into this gold uh, copper clad roof. The production of each one of those elements to give you an idea of the scale and the substructure as it's going up. That's actually an insanely beautiful cat's painting um, there. So this is actually a view from one of the bridges looking down towards the lobby of the um, of the hotel. And this is a view from one of the corridors looking back towards the bridges in the lobby. Last thing is the facade of the conference center. Each one of those, uh, say, metal flaps, it's, uh, are, it's, of course, laser cut and then hand bent, creating a kind of uh, a swarm-like effect. And again, some telephone photographs that make it look a bit surreal, like a collage. It's actually real and super cold. The roof comes down and creates also the covering. So the roof starts in the, on the base, creates the covering, creates the, um, some rooms and spaces above, uh, as well as the restaurant. The facade. And the sky bar. Okay. Um, sorry, I think the test, text speaks for itself. I promised, uh, yeah, there wouldn't be any renderings. Those are the competitors for this competition. Maybe some of them you know, MVRDV, FOA, F did. I think, uh, let's say back to the urban planning, I think one of the things that we did is, and this is, again, this refers to now, this refers to the, 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 is the name of the project, it's in Trumpsa, it's a ferry terminal, a bus terminal, and cruise ship terminal, uh, all in one. Um, we, one of the things that we did, I think was particularly uh, important there. And this is, the, this is the place where I took the picture of the women and her family in the middle of the street, um, was we designed a project based on the premises of the city, um, where all of our competitors designed a very big building. 
um, we did not design a very big building. So we, in fact, broke the building down into scales that were commensurate to the rest of the city uh, and then created public space, like really specific, dedicated public space through analysis of the city's public space space that offset uh, things that were absent or missing in the city, which now the city is kind of actively, they're like continuously looking for ways to activate that space and it's become an important contribution. And in doing so, one of the, one of the things that really motivates, uh, motivates me and my thinking is this, again, this idea of territorialization and how you can create spaces that people, you know, my clients are always asking me like, you know, you know how do you make a popular building? We make a popular building by letting the popular in, by letting the popular use it, by kind of making it accessible. Um, and that's always a really difficult thing. We're doing a similar project now for a factory, and they're saying that how does this factory, which was uh, historically taken over by the Russians and turned into something really bad, how do we make it kind of you know fit into the city again? I said, well, get rid of the wall first. And I just remove this three meter high wall that goes around the whole thing. We're like, what about our security? I said, well, what do you want to be secure from? Um, so this is the competition. This is the site standing on the mountain. So this is not a plane. There's a mountain on the opposite side, which is like 400 meters vertically straight up. So I'm standing on that point, looking down um, together with uh, a guy named Jakob de Rice. Um, and this is the site that we're looking at. This is uh, how it currently, uh, this is how it was uh, before we came into play. This is, the, this is the old city. This is the, uh, this is the church. This is the main street in the old city. Uh, lots of wooden structures, two, three stories high. Um, some really bad structures that have come up recently here uh, in the front side of the city, including, of course, shopping mall, um, which are reacting on a number of hotel buildings. But this is basically the kind of scale of the two, three stories uh, throughout the city, this is the old city. And this is actually where the boats and, 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 and fishermen landed when they came to the city. So this is a project that we, uh, that we did. Um, very quickly, this is a terminal building. This is the headquarters for the Trumpsa Harbor. Uh, and those are offices uh, related to that. This is one public space, which has the view over the water. The basic move was we lifted the street up to cover the cargo and kind of create public space, elevated public space, elevated public space, and street level public space on the front side. So by retracting the building, by cutting the building, by lifting up this public space and creating a new datum uh, and placing these buildings on that datum, we both cover our buses, cover our cargo, allow public space to come uh, on top of the building. And it looks something like this. This is the public space uh, on the front side where people uh, come in. The road is kind of lifted up. Uh, turn, uh, so the road continues into the building. Um, by exacerbating the facade lengths, that means that there's more potential for, for public interface. It doesn't necessitate going into a large, empty, uh, potentially empty hall. There are no interior pictures because, frankly, the interiors suck, um, not by our doing, but by the fact that they didn't want any interiors. But this is the public space, really beautiful views down the fjord. Going up towards the boat, you see the boat in the distance there to give you an idea of the scale of the boat, which is larger than the building, um, but also the scale of the buildings, which are similar to the size of the city. We wanted it to be rough. We didn't want to create a shopping mall out of a terminal. We didn't want, we wanted to kind of leave that roughness. You see the concrete there, the graphics are painted directly onto the concrete. So that's the access to bike parking, which slides between that amphitheater uh, and the wall, um, which is a special formwork, uh, leaving the concrete rough. The detailing is not to be uh, appreciated, but this is the mountain where the picture was taken. Uh, the first picture was taken. Um, it was never intended to, to have these, of course, but of course, everyone uh, in a city like that, the further north you go in Norway, it's kind of interesting that this idea of territory, I didn't think about it. I only thought about people, but then of course the cars park wherever they want, drive wherever they want. So they have the same kind of cowboy logic as, uh, as the people do. Um, so we had to do create some interferences to prevent that. You see just below 
the recurring pink um, or orange color. That's the, the bus is below. Looking from the boat, the cut below, this is standing inside the bus terminal. The view or the non-view from the other side of the water. There you see the cargo and the terminal on the left and the uh, headquarters on the right. From the city, from the church, the backside of the church, looking up the road, the boat and the mountain in the background, amphitheater. Again, from the boat, which brings cargo, brings cars, brings all the food transport. There's very little connection to this part of the country. So the boat is actually not just for, for tourists, which is, it's a thousand passenger boat, but it brings cars, cargo, and, and many other important kind of things delivered to the city. In the pole, this city is uh, just inside the polar circle. Sorry, the concrete, the hall con during construction some of the details from that. The bridge over the buses, the buses drive in one side and drive out the other side, I'm creating a bridge, which is this truss that you see there. Passengers coming up from below. On the one side of the building, we have speed boats. On the other side of the building, we have crews. Underneath the building, we have buses, both regional and uh, local buses. Some of the uh, dealing with the cacophony of information, tracks, lightweight ceiling that can't support anything, the truss, uh, substructure, lighting, all with a relatively low, uh, very low budget. This is the view of the key and the ISPS zone. All right, um, should I continue? Okay, good. He told me that people more or less can't stand more than 45 minutes. Uh, so I'll continue a bit more. I have a couple more things I'll show you. I, I can speak faster if that helps. Um, this is the project I also showed you the master plan for. This is how it looked originally. The city hall is the brick building with the two towers, really beautiful building built in the 30s. This is the old, uh, this is the old hall where they built machine engines for, for large uh, seagoing vessels. Basically, this is the punchline. I wanted to get that building back somehow. And I think that's what we tried to achieve with our project was to resuscitate that building that had been uh, consumed by uh, the 80s. Uh, as you know, there was this in the 80s, a big push to create quasi industrial. I mean, it happened in Baltimore. It happened, I think, here in the US as well as in Europe. Um, and uh, we wanted to erase that history. So this is the building. This is like two of the buildings, but actually we did the master plan as I showed you before. This is how it looked inside, kind of phenomenal structure uh, inside as well. And this is, this is what we were met with. Uh, so this is the original building and this is what did it turn into in the eighties. Uh, wasn't very convinced of that. Um, and this also made me less convinced Everything that's red is bleeding out. Everything that's pink is about to die. Everything that's blue is stable, but not great. And everything that's green is making money. Um, this is the diagram that started our research. This was like the information the client gave me. He said, Gary, what do I do with this information? Um, this is obviously the ground floor on the bottom, second floor and the top floor. Uh, so that's what we were working with. Um, First thing, as I said, that I told him to do was we're going to get rid of the shopping mall. We're going to delete all of those objects. Everything that you see hatched in red, we got rid of, partly because, as I said, I wanted this. So I started by deleting everything that you see. Then the curved line that's cutting through, that's the clean cut um, that cuts through all three buildings that gives you a public path, an outdoor public path that cuts through all the structure. Um, we deleted the beef house. Um, we deleted the atriums. We deleted the bridges that were connecting the buildings. There was a series of bridges connecting them um, and kind of stripped them down. Um, these are some of the things that we stripped down that you can see. Um, on the top left, that's the beef house. Um, I think here you can see some of the bridges uh, that were deleted. Um, here's a beautiful picture of the bridges, which is connecting the shopping. These are, I'm oh, sorry, you don't see. Bridges, fake balconies, more bridges, 
uh, atriums, extensions, uh, shopping signs, uh, beef house, all the appendages of the building were taken away. This is how it looked in all of its glory when we arrived. And like this, this is how it looks now. This is our deletion. In the 20 years I've been there, I never saw a person on those streets until now, but the inversion of the cores meant that 6,000 people come in and out of these buildings this is one street, but there are many streets. Um, and the interesting thing was, is when, we, when they opened up on day one, they called me and said, Gary, your concept's not working. I'm like, well, what do you mean it's not working? They're like, but you told us it was gonna be full of people and it was gonna be really, and I said, did you put any furniture there? They're like, no, that's a good idea. We have some furniture lying around, so we'll put some furniture out. And then uh, they called me a week later and said, yeah, now it's working. <laughs> um, bike parking, furniture, all the paving, everything that you see has been touched. There's nothing there that, well, I didn't touch that sign on the left, minus 30%, but everything else has been touched. The drainage, the paving, the facades, the facades in the building on the left were totally redone. And the facades in the building on the right were what you saw were totally stripped down. That facade on the right um, was like this which uh, this is exactly the same photo, which is like this now. So it gives you an idea of the intervention that we did. Um, but the intervention, again, now this is adaptive reuse. We're not making new architecture. We're not, but we're making, I would say, rather impactful kind of change. Um, these are the cores. This is the clean cut. This is the paving. This is the waterfront paving. The picture you saw on the poster, which, um, which was from the waterfront of this project. This is uh, one, and this is part of the cut. The cut continues. You see it continuing here, going through one building and out the other building. This is our uh, translation of all the cores to bring light into these deep buildings, taking the existing kind of shafts. And um, we also deleted a lot of function. This is the wrap. Everything that you saw here on the outside, we said every single window can have floors in it. Everywhere there were, there were these large windows, we're going to expose them. We're going to cut back the building. So they lost, on the one hand, as I said, they lost a lot of square meters, but they also lost a lot of square meters of shopping, but they also lost a lot of square meters because we said the facade has to, like, has to be returned and we're going to give depth back to the building again. So these kind of conditions happen, which didn't happen before. Here there were floors. All those floors were ripped out. Here there were floors, floors, and... lobbies for offices they've never had lobbies before to enter your the most expensive offices in the city are here and to enter them you had to go through the shopping mall uh, now they all have addresses which open up on the side streets this is another side street uh, this is the other side of the building okay uh, i'll show i think one more one this is the last one um this is also an adaptive reuse i'm ending with two uh, the two small ones actually yeah. One more small thing I'll show you. This is a Nedregata project that is um, that was completed some time ago. Um, one of the first kind of major adaptive reuse projects in the city. It won the prize for the for the best project in the city that year. And only interesting because it was going against, uh, let's say, um, a big famous museum by a big famous Italian architect um, on the waterfront. Um, so it's interesting for me that the city prioritized uh, adaptive reuse um, as an important frontier. This is the kind of creative core where this stands in the center, an old factory. This area is called uh, New York, actually, um, an old textile factory. Um, we did a renovation of the textile factory, which didn't have drawings. Um, we did a renovation of a neighboring building, uh, which transformed into kindergarten. And this building uh, looks like this now on the left hand side. It looked like this when we found it, when we started. Um, so this is where it came. Um, the city didn't know how the building looked. So first we had to convince them how it looked. There were no pictures in the archive of how it looked uh, before we started our transformation. That transformation included rebuilding a part of the building that had burnt down. This entire part of the building had burnt down previously, which we rebuilt after we proved how it looked, which was back to my quote, um, complete fakery. We had no idea how it looked, um, but it was necessary to have the complete fakery to get to this point. Um, these are the spaces as they were starting construction. And this is the building completed. 
very simple. Um, this is the new building that we rebuilt these upper floors. Actually, the entire building was gutted. Um, there were no, as you saw the inside of the space, there was uh, no floors, no walls. Um, we built a vertical circulation. Um, we reopened the windows to allow a light into the factory. And essentially we created a layering of space that looked like this. That layering meant that cinemas, sound studios and things were on the ground floor, the middle, uh, on the basement level, I mean, technical cinema uh, sound. And the middle floor were all the sound studios with these extremely uh, complex uh, walls. They're doing Hollywood films and things there. So basically all the floors have dilatation. So if you jump up and down on the floor and yell and scream, the person in the sound room doesn't feel, doesn't see any vibration or anything. And then as we move up the building, there were offices and a showroom on the top. The building on the right was an uh, art space, a uh, very minimalistic uh, art space, where we introduced, um, let's say, the counterpart to this vertical circulation, a beautiful stair that could, that could transform a traditional art space into a multifunctional art space for performance, uh, for alternative exhibitions and things. So this is the space inside after it's finished. Um, you see the acoustic walls that both turn towards the outside as well as towards the inside of the space. Um, the stair, which is uh, steel, um, which makes then uh, these span steel walls inside of a sound room. Moving up through the building, uh, exposed bricks, old bricks, uh, recovered bricks. Moving up through the space. Uh, renovating all the windows. Uh, here you see the bridges combined with the new concrete bridges, combined with the textured walls. Looks a bit something like this. Looking down towards the cinemas, the token green wall. Again, my obsession that you saw earlier of never allowing floors to cut across windows, creating then these double height spaces. Um, the, re the, uh, the recycled bricks that you see on the facade there. All right. And uh, sorry, and this is the exhibition space. Taking advantage of the height, opening it up, exposing the beams, painting the beams, introducing a snare, and on this side here, having artists in residence spaces. So it looks like this. Stair looks like this. Library underneath the stair. Seating on top of the stair. Some performance space. The detailing of it. All right, you almost made it. The last one's the easiest one. Um, just to go, maybe if you're lucky, you can make a connection to anything I said, but it's also the smallest project, so there's no urban in theory in it. But it's the first project that, uh, the first project that I did when I came to Norway. I actually did one project before going to Norway, uh, which was a house in Groningen with a very interesting PTFE facade, part of a master plan with Toyo Ito, um, also together with FOA and, and, and um, Tony Fretton, um, a really beautiful master plan, which, uh, which I can show another time. This is the house um, for a very young, uh, very young couple. I think they were both plus minus 30 years old. They had a waterfront property. But their house is facing the wrong way. It's kind of facing towards the water, but the water in this case is towards the north. So the house does uh, a kind of very interesting uh, move. They wanted a very open house. She wanted a uh, she wanted a farmhouse. He wanted a a fairly uh, expansive uh, villa. Um, very different kind of ideas, but the simple idea is that the two levels of the house are organized in two different directions. Uh, the um, ground floor, this is the second floor you're looking at now. The ground floor opens up towards the water. The second floor opens up towards the south, uh, the sun, the view. Um, in case you're curious, yes, there's an octopus that's silk screened on the facade. Um, that's one entry. The second entry is down uh, into the middle of the building. That cut in the middle of the building allows light to penetrate deep into the, into the space. Um, libraries on the right side, kitchens on the upper floor, living spaces below a private courtyard for the master bedroom you see there. 
um, just show you, and again, hopefully you can make some connections to other things that you've seen. Um, this is the structure. The structure is really interesting. Um, already here, let's say this project is from 2003. It's 18 years old. Uh, already here, we were experimenting. Now we're using uh, steel cassettes with insulation inside of them. Those steel cassettes allowed us to deal with prefabrication. You can see the size of each element is uh, two and a half meters or so by varying sizes from you know, five to seven, uh, seven meters long that are welded together on site. Each of those then allow us to, we kind of slide them on, created a substructure, it gives us large spans, gives us a roof that is, has a first level of insulation. So we only need a kind of cold bridge break on top of that. Uh, it allowed us to then uh, essentially create a complete column-free space. Not that we needed a column-free space, but it allowed us to do that to give us the flexibility of the interior space. This is just from the other view. So it looks something like this under construction. Um, that's uh, me in a younger, uh, hairier version. Um, this is the library on the right and the kitchen on the left. Um, this is the cut that goes through the house. So now we're looking uh, towards the water. Uh, these thin steel plates also prefabricated. And it was this whole idea we started to work with. These are 55 millimeters thick, um, a composite structure with steel and concrete, making them extremely strong. Those are each for the bedrooms. They were then painted in blackboard uh, painting. So the children were making massive drawings on the wall. Uh, at the same time, we didn't have any doors. We just created a textile, an elastic textile, the ones that speed skiers use that was sewn together with felt to create the entry to each of the bedrooms to give them acoustics and uh, tactility. It's the bedrooms, the living room, the cut going to the second floor, the fireplace in front. Here we are sliding in these elements on a temporary structure. The stair can't leave them from one side towards the glass. It says bull the says on his helmet, I think it says, Bull the Welding Machine. Uh, that's his name. This is the guy that put it all together for us. I'll just walk you quickly through it. So opens towards the south, one entry behind the octopus that you can slightly see there. Um, and then here, uh, a second entrance. So car approaches and drives underneath here. Um, it was uh, technically impossible to do. Um, so this, the car drives underneath here. The house is cantilevering and stand, or it's houses. The, the deck cantilevers and stands, uh, cantilevers stands on the mountain, um, which we kind of cut back, uh, which we wanted to, to leave it exposed. That was the stair that you saw previously. This is a view on the... Uh, on the west side of the building. This is the approach with the entry into the garage. The kitchen, which overlooks, uh, let's say, the, the dining space just below. Looking back towards the entry, this is the second entry. Entry coming directly down or the entry coming in the second floor. The bedrooms are in this wooden cabin here. There's another secret door that you don't see here that brings you down to a private room that he has. A guillotine door that allows them to, the house doesn't cantilever with the exception of this small terrace. And the guillotine door allows them to move out onto the terrace. These are the kids' rooms using this uh, special textile that we created. The fireplace, which has fire glass behind it. So every time he turns it on. Um, by the way, no, this is not their furniture. Uh, and this is pictures were taken before they moved in. Um, so uh, it's a much more uh, decadent space than this. The beginning of them furnishing it. Fancy furniture takes a long time to order. Uh, the entry, as we talked, as I talked about before, and this third cut you see is coming then from that garage that's sliding behind the terrain. So you can come from the garage directly in, from the garage directly up, from the garage directly into the bedrooms. So this flow and this kind of movement is something that was, uh, let's say, having these different conditions, summer, it's very important in Norway, it's summer condition, winter condition, um, how you use the house, how the house 
opens up, but how the house also, uh, how you can close the house down when it is winter and minus 20 degrees Celsius. The approach uh, over the roof, the same view at the and during the night, the terrace. On the right-hand side, there is actually someone showering there. Um, um, on the right-hand side is the library and uh, with a small bathroom and an apartment. This is the fireplace that comes out here. It looks like that from above. This wall opens up, the fireplace rotates, and when they want to sit outside in the wintertime, they can still sit outside and rotate the fireplace, the second fireplace. Um, yeah. This is the stair that came up from below. This is the driveway into the, and yes, it is exposed stone, just so you don't see it here. And that's his uh, library, which what I really love about the house is the way they use the house. Um, first time I was there it was a giant bird cage at the bottom of the stair, like giant meaning three meters tall and one and a half meters wide with gigantic birds inside. The next time I came was a swimming pool uh, in that space. Here, that furniture was gone and there were just pillows all over the floor, kind of bright Moroccan colors. And then the next time I came, there was a DJ booth in there and he was using it for making music. So, I mean, that's the greatest thing in such a project is when the owner just owns it. And that's the whole reason they're called the owner. When the owner owns it uh, and really makes it their own and kind of, you know, every time I go there, I have no idea what I'm going to find and what they've done to the house. Um, and that's what I really uh, respect and admire and love about it. Uh, some cheesy lamps that they had over the dining room table at that time, combined with uh, fake designer chairs that I made them throw out. They were not the wear, they were fake. All right. Um, starting a new company in New York, it's called Make Make. The lecture is called Make Make. I talked in the beginning about making. Uh, the word Make Make, well, uh, number one, it's a uh, as I said, a focus on, on making, um, which is uh, directly related to architecture, um, maybe an unnecessary, the evil twin of architecture, but uh, closely related. Make Make is an uh, epizuxis, if you guys don't know it, it's a, a very simple rhetorical uh, idea, um, creating emphasis, but basically, we're looking at making that takes into consideration the implications of urbanity, community building, reusability, economics, risk taking, making the real. So that's make make. Yeah.